If there's one song that comes to my mind from the late 90s, it's Marcy Playground's huge hit Sex and Candy. While the song was all over rock radio when I was a teenager, whatever happened to the band afterwards? Were they truly a one-hit wonder? That's what we're going to talk about in today's video. The story of the band really begins with frontman and guitarist John Wozniak, who was born in Minneapolis. In the late 70s, his education involved attending an experimental hippie school called Marcy Open Grade School. According to MTV, Wozniak was bullied and anytime he went to the playground, bullies would pick on him and beat him up. This forced Wozniak to stay inside the school at all times and think of what he would do if he was one of the cool kids. It was no surprise that when he started a band years later, he would name it Marcy Playground, and a lot of the songs he wrote were inspired by his childhood. He would tell Ampers.org that his first introduction to playing music came when he was living in Minneapolis and went to a yard sale and saw a record called Bobby Vinton Sings the Newest Hits and got his mother to buy it for him. Within a year or so, he soon started going over his father's music collection from the 50s which he found up in the family's attic. By the age of 13, he was given a guitar by a close family member, and that's when he started to write his own songs. In fact, the first song he ever wrote was a track called Rebel Sodville, which would appear on Marcy Playground's second record, Shapeshifter. That school wasn't the last of the hippie lifestyle Wozniak would experience. As he would tell the Morning Call newspaper, he followed the Grateful Dead for six years starting at the age of 14 in 1984. To support his lifestyle at the time, he would sell tabs of LSD and hard-boiled eggs. He would tell the newspaper that he took more than 100 acid trips revealing, I was like a guru. I loved that stuff, but after a while I had to stop. It was messing up my brain chemistry. Eventually it built up this buffer between myself and reality, he'd say. Wozniak would cite Neil Young, Paul Simon, and Van Morrison as his musical influences. But in addition to that, it wasn't a surprise that the Seattle music scene was also a huge influence on him as in the early 90s, he attended Evergreen College in Olympia, Washington. In fact, he played music in the same rehearsal space as Nirvana used to. He would tell the News Times paper about his time in Seattle saying, I would see Courtney Love at the Capitol Theater and I sat next to Dave Grohl while the Breeders were doing a show. They were just around all the time, those people. The, the Melvins were always in town. I mean, those guys are from there. It was really a close-knit musical scene that revolved around K Records and Kill Rockstars and the Capitol Theater. While attending Evergreen College, he wrote and recorded his first album called Zog Bog Bean in 1990 with the help of his then girlfriend in his bedroom. Several of the songs off the record would end up on Marcy Playground's later albums, and he would sell copies of that record for $6 a piece at a record store in the city, and even sent a copy to Don Rubin, who was the head of A&R at EMI, who loved the album. He would encourage Wozniak to leave school, come to New York, and form a band. He did just that. In 1994, Wozniak would move to New York City and meet an old high school classmate of his, a multi-instrumentalist named Jared Kotler. They would decide to form a band along with bassist Dylan Keefe, who they met through a mutual friend. The band would play a showcase for record label executives at EMI, and they would be signed shortly afterwards. Wozniak would tell the News Times, After we played, they were like, okay, let's make a record. That was it. We'd never played a show before. They just really liked the music, and I guess they thought we were good enough at playing this little showcase that it wouldn't matter what we did on tour. That was it. That was kind of the beginning, he'd say. The band's relationship, though, with EMI would be short-lived. Even though the label released the group's self-titled album in February of 97, it wasn't initially a big hit. Even though the song Sex and Candy was released by EMI as the lead single from the record, it was only picked up by one radio station, and that was in Fargo, North Dakota. And by the summer of 1997, the record label folded and the band was left out in the cold. Wozniak would tell the newspaper, There was this kind of weird, uncomfortable silence in our career, while also telling MTV, When a major record label closes on you, you're damaged goods. People think, you know, they were on EMI and they couldn't make it fly. They must not be good, he'd say. According to MTV, even though EMI closed its doors, some former record label employees still continued to help the band with the record. And five months after losing their recording contract, they would sign a new deal with Capitol Records. Capitol re-released the album and started shopping Sex and Candy to different radio stations. Initially, 15 stations added the song to their playlists, and it snowballed from there. Sex and Candy spent a record-breaking 15 weeks at the number one spot on the Billboard mainstream rock charts, pushing their debut album to sell over 1 million copies going platinum. But where did the hit song come from? 
While inspiration struck during the 80s, long before Marcy Playground formed, Wozniak told Billboard magazine inspiration came when he was with his girlfriend in her dorm room getting intimate at Bryn Mawr College, where Wozniak's dad taught. He would tell song facts. I always liked older girls, but we were in her dorm room and her roommate came in and she saw us there and she was like, oh, it smells like sex and candy in here. And I always remembered that. And that was back in the late 80s. And when I was writing the song and I was coming up with all these weird disco era references that I was making up, platform double suede and all that business, I was like, hey, Let's just throw in that phrase that's been sticking in my head for the last five years or whatever. So I wrote that song in 92, 93, somewhere around there, and it didn't really come out till 97. That song had at least been in my consciousness since the late 80s, at least with the concepts behind it, he'd say. Regarding the song's meaning, Wozniak would initially say it was a love song, but later admitted he had no clue what the track was about. He would also tell MTV that the song was never intended to be a hit, but rather a quirky tune. Wozniak, in the same interview with MTV, would admit that he sold his publishing rights to the song for over $1 million, while also receiving a $750,000 advance for their next record. While the song made the band a lot of money, Wozniak would admit to MTV he never wanted another successful single like Sex and Candy, revealing, I would never want another Sex and Candy. I don't mind having a hit, but Sex and Candy was too much for anybody, especially as a first hit. The song would soon find a second life being heavily licensed by commercials, TV shows, movies, and video games. And there was even some licensing opportunities that the band turned down, with Wozniak admitting he said no to both M&Ms and Coca-Cola. Shortly after the release of the band's first record, founding member Jared Codler would leave the group and turn around and sue Wozniak regarding the group's financial arrangement. The lawsuit outlined that Kotler's drumming skills weren't up to par, and Summit Capital Records implored him to stop playing with the group altogether. He would be replaced by Dan Reiser. As the band turned their attention to their follow-up record, 1999 Shapeshifter, there was a lot of pressure on Marcy Playground to deliver. Early signs indicated that the album could have been a big hit. According to Billboard magazine, the record's first single, It's Saturday, was trending pretty good first being picked up by radio stations in Providence, Seattle, and New Orleans. The band would perform at about a dozen radio-hosted concerts to promote the record, and the single would peak at number 25 on the modern rock charts. But the album quickly sputtered out. So what happened? Well, the band claimed they had no intention of writing something that would be commercially viable, as they seemed pretty jaded with their experience after Sex and Candy. Wozniak would also tell the News Times that a change in management at their record label meant that rock was no longer a priority, with the label now focusing their attention on finding the next Britney Spears and NSYNC. In addition to that, the band members would tell MTV had they produced a rap rock record, it likely would have done better. It also didn't help that the same day Shapeshifter came out, they also had stiff competition from Alanis Morissette, Metallica, Third Eye Blind, Beastie Boys, and Dave Matthews Band, who all released albums the same day. The band would also run into a short-lived controversy with the Butthole Surfers. According to MTV Shapeshifters, artwork was based on a sketch by Surfers guitarist Paul Leary and was originally supposed to be used on the cover of the Surfers' upcoming album at the time. Both bands were at one point signed to the same label, and Capitol had the artwork done by artist Mark Ryden, but then according to Leary, Capitol Records kept the artwork after the Surfers left the label and offered it to Marcy Playground. Wozniak would claim that the band was never made aware of the artwork's origins when the label offered it to them. After Shapeshifter failed to even show up on the Billboard album charts, the band was let out of their contract, with Wozniak telling the Times, After Shapeshifter, we were like, we have to get out of here. Foo Fighters had already left. Pretty much everybody had left at that point. Everclear and us were the only two left on the label, so we got off after Shapeshifter. After leaving Capitol Records, the band took a hiatus, with Riser joining Nora Jones, Keith got a job with National Public Radio, and Wozniak bought Mushroom Recording Studio in Vancouver, Canada, and started producing other bands. The band would reconvene in 2004, releasing the record MP3 on the Reality Entertainment label. Wozniak would also start work on a solo record titled Leaving Wonderland in a Fit of Rage, but it would eventually morph into Marcy Playground's next album and come out in 2009. In the following year, the band did something pretty awesome. They would get fans to take songs from Leaving Wonderland and remix them. The best remixes would be released with the winners getting a share of the royalties. And partnering with Indaba Music, the band released Indaba remixes from Wonderland. The band would release their latest record 2012's Lunch, Recess and Detention, which featured new material, rarities and b-sides, and over the past decade they've been pretty active on the touring circuit. 
That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe. We'll see you again on Rock and Roll Your Stories. Take care.